Are you the watchman over this place? Now, this is a simple kid who didn't finish high school till he was had been a policeman for several years. Uh, no education, army brat, moved around ten countries. Kids like that, even if they watch television, don't invent sentences that say, are you the watchman over this place? So there's where it begins. Shermer was taken aboard this craft uh, and given a briefing. Uh, told some of what they were doing. Talked about bases in the country. We, in Beyond Earth, we just laid out the the interview between Shermer and, and the crew. Uh, at points, he, he says they, they have been observing us for a long period of time, and they think that if they slowly, slowly put out reports and have their contacts state the truth, it will help them. They have no pattern for contacting people. It is by pure chance, so the government cannot determine any patterns about them. There will be a lot more contacts. To a certain extent, they want to puzzle people. They know they are being seen too frequently, and they are trying to confuse the public mind. He's telling me they want everyone to believe some in them. Some in them. And then he adds, so we will be open to their invasion. And now at this point, the hypnotist interjected and said, think carefully now. Did he use the word invasion? Shermer said, yes. Then this would mean they are operating to conquer the world. And Shermer said emphatically, oh, no, no. He used the word invasion, but meant it in a friendly way. He said it would be a showing of themselves completely. The public should consider in their minds that they should have no fear of these things, beings because they are not hostile. Pretty powerful stuff. Not satisfied with reading transcripts of hypnotic regression tests, Ralph Bloom has ordered a second series of tests at UCLA. At a symposium in Tampa, Bloom said he retained the services of Dr. Ronald Katz, head of the anesthesiology department. He wanted Dr. Katz to perform the tests as he watched. Some of the tests he did were fascinating. He, he regressed her through various ages, down to 11, then down to 5, then up to 17. And had him, he asked him the same question each time he said, as he brought him sort of out. He told Herb, you'll remember all this when it's over, and you can open your eyes during the trance. Now, I don't know how much you know about trances. I didn't know much. But someone can operate in a trance state with their eyes open, but they're in, act, in, com, in direct contact with the past. It's as though you cranked up the old computer, and it's feeding you whatever the brain knows, and the brain I hear knows all, and will tell all. And so Herb went back, and at 11, the question was always the same. The hypnotist said, hi. Who are you? Is there anything special about today? Well, each day he took was special because it was always Herb's birthday. The only two things that the guy knew, the hypnotist, going into this hypnosis, were the fact that Herb had had a contact on a certain date and that his birthday. He hadn't read our book, he hadn't read any of the literature, and he wasn't involved. So it was a pretty clinically clean experiment. And each time Herb was asked to write his name and, and at 11 he says can you write your name and Herb says no he says I can only print and it was moments like that that were very impressive and then watching Herb Shermer 29 laboriously printing his name as he would at 11 very interesting it's another lecture in itself or another discussion but the hypnoses were both very un impressive to us who were there and uh, watching her come up to the moment, live through it again, and experience what followed that was not available to his conscious mind was very dramatic. Herb was hypnotized twice before, once courtesy of the Air Force, and once by a private hypnotist, a doctor called Loring Williams from New Hampshire. And each time the hypnotist told him that he would remember when he came out of the trance, he would freely remember everything that happened, and he didn't. And he didn't remember again when Katz told him he would. Now, part of it's come back, and the reason I bring that up is sort of a side issue. Herb remembers a good deal, most probably, of what happened. Some from the hypnotic sessions, when he's relived the experience, and then after when that was reinforced by his hearing the tape. So he heard himself saying. But really, he had to hear it from the tape to remember it. He learned it from the tape. I, mean, I suppose remembers the wrong word. He learned about his experience from the tape. Some leak through from the experience of itself. So he has a... And we've been watching very carefully, and I'm really mean. I mean, if Herb says something that he didn't say before, I say, you didn't say that before. 
And what it turns out is that we all are, unless we're really special kind of automatons, we tell a story as, as we are. And it's really not always the same way. And sometimes you respond to pressure from the audience. You're here. I mean, the two people who are with you can exert a pressure on you. Um, it's a hard thing to tell a complicated story that you only know from having learned it secondhand. And yet it's your story. Think about that a moment if, I, if it's clear. I mean, it happened to you. You went through it, and yet you've had to be taught it through listening to a tape. The Shermer story contains many of the classic features that recur in well-researched contactee reports, from bad headaches to suppressed memory. Next to the case of Barney and Betty Hill, the New Hampshire couple who, under hypnosis, accounted for several lost hours aboard a spaceship, Shermer's is the best documented case of its kind on record.